<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, Veronica. Hello. We are back, everybody. After a long time. It's been a long time. It's actually, we looked at our Instagram to see the last post we made. It was March 10th was the last episode. And today is July 12th that we're recording this episode. Yes. So it has been a minute, but we are back after pausing for all of the COVID pandemic insanity-ness. Well, in um, fact, it also, I mean, Nashville was hit with a tornado, remember? And that oh, that's, was, yeah. That was yeah. what... That was part of it. Even though I was in New Orleans, Nashville was hit pretty hard. And then right after that happened, COVID began. Officially began. It was a really weird month. March was really difficult. And it kind of, uh, a lot of stuff happened on many different levels. And just priorities kind of shifted a little bit. So sadly, we had to put this on the back burner. But we are resurrecting it. And we're going to finish out this second season now. Better late than never, right? And the second season, just to remind all of you, is about destruction, vandalism, and also to remind all of you, all of you. Um, all, of you all of our many, many, many listeners. Right. <laughs> um, hi, Mom. So we are, we're both criminal defense investigators with backgrounds in art. We've worked with artists at museums, just... A lot of all the different things, opening galleries and so We've on. Been so art writers. Writing about art, you know, the whole thing. But we both work in, we're investigators. Haven't we done in the art world? Seriously. What um, haven't we done? I mean, I have not been an art, a visual artist. I was a visual artist. I went to art school. Yeah. So there's. What if we, there's got to be something that, well, there's a difference, but I'm wondering if there's something that neither of us have done. Uh, have you been an art handler? I haven't. No, I haven't either. Not in any real way. Okay. Yeah. I know a lot of art handlers. I've like ordered art handlers around. (laughs) That sounds horrible, but um, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I haven't. Well, there we go. Done. Okay. Yeah. We figured that one out. Um, Yay. (laughs) So we have been in the art world for many years and then we both went into Private investigation, criminal mm-hmm. defense investigation. Well, I guess not private, private and public, all different sorts. We're doing, of we're doing both, <laughs> doing the private and the public kind. Um, <laughs> so that's and and that's why we did this podcast because we both explore crimes, how they happen, and and then this podcast is an intersection of both of those things because these are specifically art crimes. So season one was about heists. Season two is more about destroying art, like mm-hmm. illegally destroying art. And um, and that's where we're at at the moment. That's so we're going to like down the road, we're going to get into like murder. But that's season three when who knows what the state of the world will be. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> yeah. I mean, back in season one, would we have ever thought that this is where we would be in season two? Hell no. No, if you, no. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> we not. We didn't even know you were going to be in New Orleans. <laughs> I know. It's like, it is, a lot has happened. Yeah, and now I'm here to, I think I'm here to stay for as long as the city wants to stay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? As long as that city just keeps, keeps its head above water. Yes, exactly. So yeah, we're back. Okay, we're back into what we were doing before. Um, we did a few episodes, I think four episodes on art, vandalism, and destruction. Mm-hmm. Um, we've explored different aspects of it. Um, for example, there was an episode where there is one particular artwork. People want to fuck with it all the time. And that's Duchamp's urinal. So there's like repeat and it's a urinal. So people want to usually piss yeah. in it, but you, sh- but then they end up just hitting it with a little hammer. That's what we learn. <laughs> a lot of people yeah. just do that. Yeah. Um, uh, and then we talked about, um, some kissing stuff. Yeah, all the artwork that's been kissed and made, you know, sweet, passionate love to. Yes, with lipstick. Maybe not that far. Yeah, I was like, actually, no, we did talk about. Well, we talked about um, the cherry on the spoon in we Minneapolis. did. Yeah, but we didn't talk about like, let's just go to this place. I'm just going to take us there. We didn't talk about someone like <laughs> jacking off on artwork <laughs> to be <laughs> just. Is that what you define as sweet, passionate love? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas Sarah just sees it as a 
amorous kissing, <laughs> sweet, tender yeah. kissing. Of That's the what art. sex is, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's when two people kiss. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sarah, that's what it is. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we've covered some things, but one thing we did not really cover, correct me if I'm wrong, is um, an incident where the artist destroys his, her, their own artwork. A lot of artists have done that, but at what point does that, cr- does it cross the line to do that? And it's a crime, you know? I mean, there are countless examples of artists who distorted an entire body of work before say they became famous artists and oh right yeah and that was permissible because it didn't belong to anyone but them so for example like i think agnes martin before she moved to new york city she destroyed all of her artwork all of it like didn't even want it to exist it's almost like she knew Mm -hmm. that she was moving she's canadian but was moving there from um new mexico it was almost like she knew that everything she was doing before was in no way related to what she was going to do in New York. She just wiped out that entire body of work and then became the painter that she is now. I mean, she's dead, I think. Um, but that she Agnes became. Martin? Agnes Martin. I'm pretty sure she passed away. She's Has old. she passed away? Oh, shit. <laughs> But I have let's to see. This I can't. Is a yeah, I'm not going to just be a art trivia. All right, let's see. Is Agnes Martin dead? I hope she never hears this podcast. Well, if not, she's in her 90s. She's very old. Yeah, that if makes me. Is alive. Yeah. She's deceased. She died in 2004. Whew. I mean, sad. <laughs> but I don't want to say this person's dead if they're not. I'm, but I'm, I'm right. Clear. She was very old when she died. She was born in 1912 and she died in 2004. Mm. so she was 90 something maybe she, that's what i was thinking of that just she was in her 90s when she died yeah she had a long life and i, I don't that. think and her career didn't really get started until the 60s i want to say mm-hmm. um i mean it didn't become she didn't become known until then so that means she was like in her 50s when she started getting recognition of course maybe i'm wrong maybe it was before the 60s and Maybe this episode should just be about Agnes Martin and all the times <laughs> that I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get everything wrong. Her date of birth. Her death <laughs> Let's just state. make up a new history of Agnes yeah. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I bring her up because she's an example of of an artist. You know, destroying their own artwork and whatever. That's fine. And Baldessari. Another one. Yeah. Florence Stedheimer. She tried to. Oh. She tried in her will, like all of her. Um, all of her paintings that she left behind, she wanted, she, like in her will, she asked her sister, who was the executor of her estate, to burn all of her paintings. And her sister was like, hell no, these are beautiful paintings. They're amazing. And she sent them out to museums and like actually got her career started. Wow. So that, like what is that impulse is so bizarre. And Florence Stedheimer's paintings are so cool. They document like all the artists that were working at that, like she painted her friends and then like, lo and behold, the like little New York circle that she was hanging, she was hanging out with like Stieglitz and O'Keefe and Carl Van Vechten and all those people. And she was um, documenting and painting portraits of all them, like at parties and stuff. And so it's like a, an awesome historical record. And she just wanted it all burned. I think she actually burned a lot of them herself because there are not a lot of her paintings left. Wow. But, so... But she wasn't really well known before she died, right? No, not at all. So mm-hmm. why do you think she wanted to destroy the work? Like, why do you think she felt that way know. when she was dying? Especially after you're dead, because who cares after that? Well, I don't know. Maybe she didn't thing, like though. them. I don't really know. Everyone, I think, really cares about who they are after they're dead. This came up in a past episode but you know, a lot of writers, they leave behind novels. That's the way to like live forever is they leave these things behind that will survive them or people have children because, well, for what amongst reasons to have them, it's kind of like you just continue through them. So in a way, I get why someone would be like worried about, oh, what's going to happen to my work after I die let's just destroy it because I won't be able to control it anymore. I mean, it's very, Mm -hmm. a lot of artists are control freaks. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, then they're like, I, I, Baldessari, he Mm -hmm. burned up 
like hundreds of his paintings because he was just lugging them around. He moved to California and he just decided I'm going to burn all of these. He got his students involved. He was going to, he was teaching at an art school there. They burned it, all the paintings in like a crematorium. So they did like a death. So like had the ashes left. Yeah. And like I've seen like depictions, like these ashes exist in certain forms. One form is a book. The ashes were compacted into like a a sculpture of a book, a book, and then another one into a stack of cookies. That's another way to go. Disgusting ass cookies. Yeah. But part of me, if someone was like, do you want to take a bite of the Baldessari painting cookie? I would say yes. You would do it? I would totally to have that energy in you. Yeah. Yeah. I I would do it. It's like, it's a story to tell. I think it's might be akin to eating paint chips though. I won't. Oh, hear. maybe problematic. Yeah. <laughs> maybe a little bit, maybe, but probably not. It's worth it. Let's see then. Oh, I mean, it, the destruction of one's own art goes way back. It's like Michelangelo. He did it. Uh, what did he destroy? Okay. So there's a very, um, I think he destroyed a few things, but one in particular... It was a marble, it was like a marble sculpture, um, and it was of Christ. Apparently, he had a problem with it, um, and we don't really know what it was. There's a theory that he had an issue with the type of marble that was used, but he took a hammer into Christ's left leg and arm and destroyed both of them and then walked away and never wanted to have anything to do with it ever again. (laughs) Oh, that sounds like a temper tantrum to me. Yeah. We wonder where this notion of the tortured artist comes from. Like, thanks, Michelangelo. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wonder whoever commissioned that was probably very upset with him. Yeah. Very upset. But it, I mean, that the, would have been already purchased probably. Yeah. I, I mean, that's like how it went back then. Back he wasn't then. just like making stuff for himself and then selling it afterwards. He would be like, someone would a- ask him to make a thing. And then he would do it. Exactly. So that's where that takes us up into the territory of when is it problematic, potentially like legally problematic for a, for an artist to destroy their own art work. Mm -hmm. And I learned, I, so I live in New Orleans and I learned about, um, an artist who, who did this? He has an interesting story in himself. So we can kind of dive in there if you're ready. Let's do it. Okay. Um, so his name is Scott Campbell, an artist with a really weird background. So he's from Louisiana. He became a biochemist and lived in Texas. One day he just left that life behind. Um, oh, let me also contextually like, put this into a time. He was born in 1977. So he must have been moving to, um, when he left the biochemist world behind, he went to San Francisco. So I'm guessing around dot-com boom time, he heads that way. He goes there and works as a copy editor at City Lights. Mm-hmm. Love that store and I've never been. It's amazing. I want to. Yeah. And they have a little like publishing operation and, um, or did, I don't think anymore. And there was a tattoo parlor near City Lights. And um, it was one that had a whole entire legacy that was created by one of the tattoo, like the tattoo artists who started it. Um, also, I'd like to say, uh, I'm going to interrupt you real quick to give a yeah. shout out to Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who was all up in the City Lights bookstore. He is 101 years old. He is He's not still dead. alive. Yes. Do you not remember last year they did like his 100 <sighs> year? It was like Lawrence Ferlinghetti turns 100. And I think he opens City Lights um, or he was a co founder of City Lights. Yeah. He was a huge part 101. of it. 101. And he was like in the whole beat scene where they were doing all sorts of insane drugs. And like, I'm sure yeah. that man has parted his ass off his whole life. Yeah. Maybe, not. So Maybe he's, he's like an introvert. He's 101. That's amazing. He's 101 years old. I just think that's. Yeah. Shout out to him. And you have that really cool poster of him in your house, which is I from do. City Lights, right? Or I don't. It was a it was a gift from like a two thousand four ex boyfriend. <laughs> ah, yeah, it was a great gift, a very very great gift. But I, I don't know where he got it. I have to say, um, shout out to ex boyfriends who give good gifts. Like it, 
I still have a lot of mine. Thank you. We don't, we probably don't talk anymore, but you know, thanks a lot. Yeah. I wonder if, yeah. I wonder if that guy knows that I still have that poster on my wall. He probably senses it. I mean, I, I flipped out when he got it for me. So yeah, you honor that poster and it's, I think I do. Amazing. (laughs) Um, okay. So yeah. City lights. It's this cool place. He's working there. But he's nearby um, this tattoo parlor that is being run or actually was started by... Talking to the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone, we're trying to learn to talk into our microphones and it's weird because we're on a computer and we're looking at stuff. Yeah. I have a microphone (laughs) on top of seven books on a stool. Um, Very cool books. Art books. Yeah. All right. So this guy, Scott Campbell. He moves to San Francisco and he's near this tattoo parlor that's in that area of San Francisco. What is it like North Beach? I think that's what it's called. Um, And so this parlor had been owned by this guy named Lyle Tuttle. And not like I want to give you guys a bunch of names to work with, but after researching Scott Campbell, I was like learning more about Lyle Tuttle and he's fascinating in himself in a way he's arguably arguably because i'm no expert on tattoos um but he is the tattoo artist uh, or american tattoo artist who took tattoo world into a kind of celebrity realm what do you mean like celebrities getting tattoos or just like the subculture of tattoo stuff more more to the point where the subculture world of tattoo uh made its way into the the big celebrity world and then celebrities were wanting to get tattoos like i never really even thought about that and yeah i guess i I, like when i think about or previous to learning about this i kind of thought tattoo world always a big thing big for everybody everyone wants tattoos but then i realized wait no like tattoos are a whole thing we like associate it with sailors for example or you know (laughs) it's not what we do well, I mean, just, are those the OG tattoo people? Traditionally, or <laughs> you know, I associate it with prisoners. I mean, that that's too. like my when I think of like original tattoos, I think of prisoners, right? Which it's great that you. But I'm glad you're bringing it goes that up. way back. But it goes way way back. There's, way um, back. I mean, it goes as who knows who the first person to get a tattoo was, but I know that, for example, there was this guy, he was an astronomer. Apparently he would tattoo, like in the 17th century, he would tattoo the constellations on his body. He would do it himself. Um, I wish I knew his name right now, but all to say. I just Googled a picture of Lyle Tuttle and he looks awesome. Oh yeah? Describe him to us. Okay, he, there are numerous photos of him from like when he was, young to when he was old and he's got like a full blouse of tattoos <laughs> it's like it literally looks like a shirt it's like he, it looks like he's wearing a long sleeve shirt that's just tattoos so even when he's naked he looks like he is fully clothed and he oh. looks like a total badass and like when he's old so i guess he's dead now but mm-hmm. um his old man pictures are so cute in a badass way. I've learned that I say cute for inappropriate things. Oh yeah? How did you learn that? Uh, I just found myself saying it about like things that aren't cute at all. Like, can you give us an example? Like this old man with tattoos. It's so oh, cute. That is cute though. Is right? it? I've, my thought is that's cute. And I guess when Josh and I were like, we're like searching at like houses and apartments everything was cute i was like oh that's cute that's cute and it's like architecture it's like a structural thing Mm. that's it's not i don't know i think i use that word a little too much okay yeah i get what you're saying i i i like the word but i i know the what you're talking about the feeling of it doesn't apply to a whole bunch of stuff yeah right man anyways back to lyle tuttle who i encourage anyone who's listening right now to just do a quick google because he it's delightful. It was his legacy that attracted Scott Campbell, who was at City Lights at the time, towards becoming a tattoo artist, if I did my research correctly. And this matters because 
Scott Campbell now is one of these tattoo artists that all sorts of celebs want to get tatted up by. Penelope Cruz, Heath Ledger, just a lot of stars. Mark Jacobs, you know, those kind hmm. of people. Um, they're yeah. like, if they're going to get one, they want it from him. And I even found out the one that I'm the most impressed with is Nan Golden. Oh. Um, yeah, I in kind of trying to get a sense of this guy. I found a letter she wrote him in which she said, Dear Scott, you're always so gently giving me the best excuse to get out when all I want is to get in. Finding you was one of the greatest lucks of my life. At a fashion shooting of Marc Jacobs, there was a beautiful Asian girl covered in exquisite drawings. I asked her who did them and she told me Scott, but she said, it will take you a very, very, very long time to get to see him. Everyone wants him. With you and me, I didn't have to wait. You got the word and we got together quick. I want you to write my autobiography of my body on my body. You're the one. I finally found my ghostwriter. Wow. That's an intense letter to a one tattoo artist. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Nan Golden. So when I found that, I was Huge like, fan. yeah, I was like, okay, very cool. Heath Ledger. Great. But Nan Golden, like that gets my attention, yep. especially like kind of writing love letter to a tattoo artist and, mm -hmm. you know, just trusting him entirely. Someone like her trusting him entirely with her body. So, so that's, he became this he became a tattoo artist, but he's also, he's not just a tattoo artist. He's a visual artist as well. And he has done some really weird projects where, for example, okay. So he does these, he does these currency sculptures mm -hmm. and they are of money. So he takes American money, real dollars. And then, mm -hmm. um, probably through a combination of like laser cutting and some hand carving, he carves the money into sculptures. And so wow. if you, yeah, if you look at them, they have like a very uh, topographic look to them. So he's basically taking a lot of images that he's attracted to drawing as tattoos and then transferring them into a sculpture form, but built out of currency. And and then he does other things too. He like builds strange tattoo machines and he um, using all sorts of random objects and he does uh, drawings into eggshells. It seems like he's playing around with like fragility, death, all these themes that he initially did as like drawings on bodies and then transfers them into other forms. And so he's, he started to become kind of a bigger deal because he was like riding on this tattoo artist fame that he has but now he's also doing these other projects however tattoos are always a part of it in a way so we went to mexico city to work in a he wanted to go spend some time in a prison there he has a whole thing because as you said like the tattoo world of prisons and jails it's it's a major scene um and i think he's drawn to going to places like that and learning more about what they want to get tattooed and why and what the connection is between that and the process of getting that tattoo while you're incarcerated. He seems to have a thing with this. Also with military people, as he went to Afghanistan and did a whole project there with a bunch of uh, soldiers, like, but the kind that only ride in parachutes. Anyway, uh, para I don't know. <laughs> paragliding. Only ride around in parachutes. Well, only know. the soldiers that ride around in parachutes. Just those <laughs> ones. Um, no, but he went to this. He so he went to this jail or no a prison in Me outside of Mexico City called Santa Marta. And um, while he was there, he loves Mexico City. It's one of his favorite places. It's a great place. Yeah. Um, our very first episode ever was about Mexico City. Wait, mm -hmm. it's so funny that I say ever, as though we've been around for a thousand <laughs> years. <laughs> so he he was doing a project there and Vice, Matt, like Vice magazine, I guess has a an art gallery in Mexico City. And the, interesting, huh? Yeah. And I should say this is 2010. They ask him if they can do an art show and he agrees to do an exhibition there through their gallery. 
in part because he loves Mexico City and in a way, this is a way to have more of a connection to the city. He doesn't need to do a gallery show there to make money or anything. You know what I mean? Like he's doing fine in that regard. Right. So he agrees to it. And then in the negotiation process with this gallery, they tell him, we want to have a sponsor. And he's like, I really want the the sponsorship to be very minimal within this. Like, I don't want that to be a big part of it. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll be fine. And then it turns out it becomes really like flashy advertising for some vodka brand in connection to his show, which then leads to him arguing with the the gallery director. Mm -hmm. So they're writing emails back and forth and he goes to Mexico City or he's already in Mexico City. I don't know exactly like what the situation was, but no, he was there. He was already just there. And he decides, okay, I'm going to go to the gallery and try to have a conversation in person about the situation. He's mad about the sponsorship issue, but then he's also mad because this gallery director is so obsessed with money. And he's like, we've already sold out of the entire show. And the artist felt really disgusted by the way this was being communicated, by what happened. So he goes to the gallery with some friends and he tells them, well, okay, first he goes to the gas station across the street from the gallery and gets a gallon or whatever of gasoline. Then they wait out front and he's like, I'm going to go talk to this, this gallery director. And if it, if it doesn't go well, we're going to start pulling all the art out and setting it on fire. So he goes up and talks to him and apparently it did not go well. It was a nasty conversation. Oh so he no. Goes, yeah. He goes down and he, there, there's a whole photo documentation of this. He stacks up all the artwork. They pour gasoline all over it. They set it on fire. The guy comes out and is freaking out, you know, and he has to go get this other person that works with him to come, uh, like negotiate with him and she's better at communicating so basically she's like hey hey hey, we don't want this to be a problem and he's like i'm gonna walk away and go get dinner you guys figure out what you want to do about the fire if you want to put it out or what we'll go from there wow these are works that have already been sold right so what were the works what was like what was in the show so this has been one of the harder things to figure out but when you see them stacking up all the works they're framed pieces so um i think they're a combination of his like drawings and some of those money sculptures but maybe kind of flattened so they can fit Mm -hmm. within a a frame that can be mounted because i didn't see any artwork that was anything when you look at the pictures they're stacking up all of these framed items got it from what i understand is they put out the fire, but for the remainder of the exhibition, they had to show them as partially burnt and that Scott Campbell agreed to remake the pieces after the show for... Really? Yeah. That's kind of shocking. I agree. And I don't really know if that's what happened because I asked my friend Jorge in Mexico Mm -hmm. City about this and he was like, oh, I remember hearing about this. He said, I think they actually sold for more as the burnt pieces. Like the collectors who had the opportunity to have those pieces remade and intact wanted them singed and partially burnt. And <laughs> that was the preference. That's so funny. We've talked about this before in the podcast about how these stories become part of the works legend in a way. You know, it becomes part of what, their cachet and why they're cool and that's that's a great example of when people want the destruction around. They want remnants of it because it right. helps the story, I guess. Well, yeah. I mean, the piece is just all the more special. Who wants to have the piece that was remade after this dramatic moment? This kind of mm-hmm. stand, a standoff that happened. I, you know, I'd rather have the one that has some burnt bits, and you know, that's more interesting. I think that's more valuable. Hmm. What if it was totally destroyed? What if it, like, I wonder where the line is between, like, ashes and a burnt artwork. Like, where does it stop? Where is the point where you're like, never mind, I don't want this anymore? Right. It'd be fun to kind of get in touch with all the people, or not get in touch with them, but find out what what piece was the most messed up that was still accepted at a value that was probably really pretty high, considering... 
mm-hmm. you know, this guy does well financially. He's, you know, he's just from some Louisiana Bayou suburb world and made his way to becoming a tattoo artist in the strangest path possible. I'd, you know, from biochemistry to working at City Lights to becoming a tattoo artist. But uh, he, when he opened his own tattoo parlor, he called it Saving, like Saving. But I think he's, it's like spelled with an apostrophe. Saving? Saving. All right. <laughs> and, it's called like Saving Gallery? It's it's his parlor. It's like his tattoo oh, studio. Oh, parlor. Yeah. Yeah. Which some people think it it's associated with some Christian, you know, some, oh. but he says it's about money and <laughs> uh, about getting out of the grind. He mm-hmm. takes a lot of pride in having somehow sidestepped that existence in this world. So it makes sense that he would have taken the stand that he did or gotten as pissed off as, as he did. To the mm-hmm. point where he sets his shit on fire. If his whole life is about kind of escaping escaping the capitalist machine or at least knowing how to fuck with it mm-hmm. in a really high risk way. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I don't like it. I mean, I don't like it for the people who bought his work and then, you know, had to deal with that stuff because maybe it was stressful for them. But who I don't knows? know. I think it's in terms of making statements against the way things are or should be or function in the art world. Like I support getting angry about it. I do too. And probably the collectors that bought his, you know, bought the whole show before it was even exhibited are just, you know, just some really wealthy people who, yeah. Who are probably just buying like investment pieces or something. Yeah. So I can't really feel that bad for them, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. So it's weird. It's kind of hard to find examples of artists who destroyed their artwork after it was bought and then therefore owned by someone else or an institution. Mm -hmm. Um, They exist. I mean, they're out there. There's that like famous Katie Nolan piece in Canada where it's a sculpture of log. It's like a log cabin sculpture, but they, uh, without asking her, they replaced the logs with something else. They didn't like run approval by her. And so she went up there and like, (laughs) hi, Pablo. What's up? (laughs) Don't don't bark while I'm podcasting, buddy. Um, You know, she burned down that sculpture, but she had kind of had grounds because they didn't ask her in advance if they could change an actual part of it um right because at that point it's not hers or it's not what she intended it to be right and they're putting her name on it falsely if she didn't approve everything right other than that i I mean can you think of an example of an artist who destroys their own artwork that's up at a museum or belongs to a collector i mean the thing that comes into mind is that banksy piece that destroyed itself right i kind of just delete Banksy from my brain. Yeah, I know. But I feel like if we don't talk about it, people are going to be like, the Banksy thing. They'll be like, what? They don't know about Banksy? What what kind of (laughs) art people are they? (laughs) Yeah, we know about So we have to talk about that. Yeah, the painting that destroyed itself in its frame. Right. When it got... We'll begrudgingly talk about it. (laughs) I'll begrudgingly talk about it. Sorry, y'all. Banksy isn't my jam. No. And also, I should correct something. The tattoo parlor isn't called Savin. It's called Saved. Saved. Oh, that's even more Christian-y. Now that, yeah, because Savin doesn't sound... <laughs> I got a, Well, now we got to open up a tattoo parlor called Savin. I agree. It can be next to um, the Thickest Thieves tattoo parlor that I passed when I was in... Where was I? Oh, Denver? Was Arizona? I was, it was either Denver or Arizona. I can't remember. But there was, I was walking down the street for all of our listeners. I was walking down the street and all of our many, many listeners passed a tattoo shop called Thickest Thieves. And I took a picture of it and I sent we, it to Veronica. We have to get our, um, like our logo or something tattooed. Let's do it. Or the bear. We were talking or about the bear. bear. Oh my God. <laughs> And I only have two teeny tiny itty bitty insignificant tattoos and you have zero, right? I have zero. Yeah. I just don't know. Like when you have zero, getting one just seems so weird. 
I mean, I guess everyone who has tattoos got one when they had zero, (laughs) but I'm so far along now that I don't know. It's going to have to be because now I think the pressure's on. So it's going to have to be something so important or just so radically stupid that it's low pressure. Yeah, um, it's true. that Because we'll it's not that I do. haven't had a ton of ideas. Right. Throughout my life, I've always had the, like, I'm about to go get this tattoo. Mm-hmm. And then something has just stopped me and I haven't done it. So um, You telling me that story reminds me of the story of Scott Campbell getting his first tattoo. What is it? Tell me. Well, he, I think he was, like, in his uh, late teens or, like, 20 in Texas and um, went into a tattoo parlor with $20 and said, I want to get a tattoo. I got 20 bucks. What can I get? And the guy said, well, boys get skulls and girls get butterflies. So you pick. And he said, (laughs) skull, you know, and, (laughs) you know, ever since then, now I've been reading these interviews with him and he he considers himself a very romantic tattooer. Like to him, it's so meaningful what he's tattooing on people. And then there are the people out there who do it and they just don't give a fuck. They're just kind of like, what do you want? All right, fine. That's kind of interesting that that moment influenced him so much down the road to do tattoos that were meaningful and and or romantic to yeah. him. There was, I cannot remember the name of the tattoo artist. Um, I was watching this documentary on Netflix called Hip Hop Evolution. Have you seen this? It's like numerous episodes and it just kind of talks about the evolution of hip hop. There's a lot of New Orleans stuff in there. Um, Mm. Yeah, it's really fascinating whether or not you listen to it or like it. Like the history of kind of how all these things came to be is incredibly interesting. Um, And they are... They spend a lot of time talking about this one tattoo artist who gives tattoos to like every single rap person that you know of. And he's done this, like his empire, it was just insane for a long time. He's no longer like at the top, but it was going through um, just all the people that he had tattooed. And his name is really simple and I can't remember it right now. Oh, Hmm remember it one of these days go watch hip-hop evolution Uh, yeah (laughs) no absolutely i need something like that to watch right now no it's fun doing little ep on tattoos don't you think i mean it's it's not an ep on tattoos but it's got a tattoo heaviness that we never had before isn't that weird that's so weird (laughs) i wonder why that's happening yeah (laughs) (laughs) tattoo world is very fascinating I'm surprised that it doesn't cross over more in a kind of more meaningful way with the art world. Cause I feel like whenever it does, there's something, there's still a divide between like the academic, like art gallery scene and tattoo stuff, very similar to graffiti artists when they like kind of cross over into like what we'll call like the fine art world or whatever. Like there doesn't seem to be much of a link there or like a strong link. And you would think that there would, because they're both, I don't know. I mean, I feel like there's so much artistry there and so much of a following that these types of visual arts would mesh a little more than they do. I like the moments when they do a lot. Um, In fact, I have this book that the microphone is on top of it. That is an example of an, an artist who did that, who goes by multiple names, but one of them is Dr. Lacra. It's hard to find those intersections. I think in part because that really academic art scene um, that might be more dominated by like conceptual art doesn't readily get into conversations with say tattoo world because I don't know, tattoo world is, isn't really academic. Like it's not an academic realm. They don't apply a bunch of, as far as I've experienced, like I don't see a bunch of theory being applied to, to that. And I also think it's like a people's art. It's, Mm -hmm. someone doing Donald Judd inspired sculptures is usually is going through these academic channels to, to get there. I mean, not, Mm -hmm. it's not always the case, but it's often the case. So, um, but there is a lot of, there's a lot of symbolism and tradition and things that are kind of woven into the tradition of certain tattoos that I would be fascinated to learn about 
But I guess it, what it's missing in a lot of ways is like, like you said, the conceptual element where there's not really a lot of, or at least I don't, I don't think maybe there is, maybe there's a whole world that is like, has this philosophical notion and conceptual ideas behind the work. And mm. they see, they see it and, and they like, there's a whole group of people who work in conceptual tattoos. Mm. Can't imagine what that is, but Yeah, my brain is doing like all sorts of crazy gymnastics trying to think about a conceptual (laughs) tattoo. I don't know. I feel like a conceptual tattoo could be like one dot on the shoulder, one dot by the earlobe, one dot in the middle of the forehead. One. Why are they all dots? I don't know, but I'm seeing it as like right, like hardly their tattoos that are. The only way to understand them is you have to analyze all the dots in a certain way. (laughs) You know what I mean. Or Which, one that isn't tattoos that aren't necessarily appealing or sensible at first. Like they're not maybe like abstract tattoos that are not any. So I don't know, person. I mean, these already exist in a lot of ways, but maybe just a person tattoos just one of their entire arms red or something. Yeah. Like, and it's just meant to be that. It's not meant to be anything else. It's not meant to be a picture of something. It's just meant to be a red tattooed arm. Well, kind of like, um, you know, Mike Callaway Fagan. Oh, yeah. He had the blue hand. All blue. Just keeps bluing it up. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen him in a minute, but... It's probably you know, still blue. I imagine the blue is just expanding. Right, yeah. Or growing over the entire body. <laughs> Cartoon. His name is Cartoon. Whoa! I just remember this. come back to you? I don't know. It just Wait. did. I was thinking of Mike's blue hand, and I was thinking, I don't it know. It took you to Smurf. I think it that's what happened. Cartoon, Smurf, this, cartoon. this hip-hop evolution, so, guys, uh, this cartoon. I love this moment. All right. It's have we have we discussed our artists destroying their own artwork to its end? Yeah, we have. We've and been I'm, talking for a minute. So yeah. I'm hung I'm <laughs> hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and I just roasted some potatoes that have been hanging out in there. They're for just a long sitting time, there so. sweating. We haven't done like a goodbye. Like we haven't been. I know. Mode right. so long. How do we say it? We just say thanks. Thanks for listening, everybody. This podcast is brought to you by We on This Town, the greatest podcast in all of the land. Greatest yeah. podcast network. Network. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then our theme music is by Patrick Dampier, and our artwork is by Saskia Colgis who is also a badass. Yeah, lots of badasses happening that's, here. That's true. All right, um, so we will see you guys on our next episode about some art crime related topic. Yeah, we'll be we'll be back on a regular basis now. We missed you. Yeah, we missed you so much. <laughs> <laughs>